Well, everybody, welcome to the Peace and Justice Studies Association 2020 online conference. Today, we have a, a panel we've entitled Restorative Justice in Indigenous Educational and Traditional Contexts. And we have three different uh, groups of, or a group of panelists that are gonna be presenting um, on that. And uh, I just do a couple of etiquette things to start off. Uh, we are recording, so if you don't want your picture shown on the recording, you can stop your, your camera. Um, the, the reason we're recording is we're putting them up on the PJSA website, um, and if you're a member, you'll have access to that. So I want to kind of put the plug in for membership. I happen to be the institutional liaison to the board for PH, PJSA, and so I'm, I'm very keen on trying to get institutional members to join or rejoin, um, but also I would say we want to be sure to make sure that that individuals join. And so one of the, the beauties of this conference this year is that we've allowed students to come in for free in hopes that they'll find things uh, that they like in the conference and that they'll become members. So um, there's, there's, as you've seen when you registered, hopefully there are different um, that it's $25 per month. I want to remind people as well that if you registered for, for September, even if you registered for free for September, you need to go in and register for October and November if you want to see those. Each month is a different Zoom link and a different, um, and a, you know, a different ticket. So if you have a ticket for September, it's not going to work for October or November. And there's a whole lot more program coming. So we look forward to um, to seeing you at some of those things. This, this month has been on restorative justice and we've had a number of panels and, and conversations and, and talks. The last talk for this month, the last keynote talk will be Erica Huggins on the 29th of September. And then in October, we move to uh, narrative uh, storytelling and peace building uh, as, as the kind of theme. And there'll be a series of keynote talks similar to what you saw in, in October. Um, and then in November, we have polarization, which will happen right around election time, and there will likely be a lot of polarization in the United States, at least. Um, and so the theme for, for November is polarization. So I just want to re remind people to make sure that they get their tickets for the individual months so that they can come to those. Um, my name is Jeremy Rinker. I am a, a professor of peace and conflict studies at University of North Carolina Greensboro. I'm sitting in my office here at UNCG and um, I'm going to pass off. Uh, I, I, the only other thing I'll say logistically for people is that if you have questions, I think we've decided we're going to hold questions towards the end. We're going to let each panelist give their presentation and then hopefully have some rich dialogue about what you heard. Um, in, the, in the, the, the last part of the session today, and the session goes until 6 p.m. Eastern time, whatever time that is where you are. Um, and so if you do have questions during the presentation and you wanna put them in the chat box or you would prefer to put them in the chat box, I'm happy to use that as a space where I can ask some, I can take your questions and ask them as they kind of come in. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll play it by ear as we go forward. Um, the first group that's going to present is um, is a group from the Peace Peddlers, uh, who they can explain who they are and what they do. I'll, I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. And the title of their talk is Reducing Violence in Schools and Communities, Where Do We Start and How Do We Fix It? So I'm going to pass off to you, Dr. Morton, and your colleagues to um, to start us off. Well, thank you so much. We are really excited to be here today. So. I'm going to hand this over to my colleague, Antoinette. She's going to lead us off, and I will end, and Monica will um, do the main presentation. So, Antoinette? Yes, thank you. Greetings, everyone. It's a pleasure for our team to present to you today on behalf of Peace Peddlers. And as Jeremy has mentioned, uh, we're going to have an opportunity to have rich dialogue at the end. So. We just want to present a couple of tools that we feel will be instrumental to each of your areas of influence. So as mentioned, uh, we are discussing violence in schools and communities. Where do we start and how do we fix it? Um, that in itself is a big question. How do we fix the problems that we have and how do we become 
agents of change to be a part of that solution. So today presenting uh, is the three of us and I will first introduce myself. I am Antoinette Dunstan, a native of New York, a resident of Georgia. I have had the pleasure of uh, being the founding executive director of the First Ladies Youth Leadership Foundation and currently serving as the communications director for Peace Peddlers. My background is inclusive of 11 year experience in the educational setting, middle school primarily, and currently working at the district level. Uh, next we have with us a part of our team is our director, Dr. Cynthia Morton, and I'll let her introduce herself. Yes, hello everyone. I am Cynthia Morton and I am the director of school programs with Peace Peddlers, but most importantly, I am a mom and a grandmother and a pet parent. So I want to get a plug in for the family. Um, in addition to my role at Peace Peddlers, I am a licensed professional counselor uh, and I am a mediator. Um, we also, Antoinette, Monica, and I run a peer mediation, peer leadership program within Rockdale County, which is outside of Atlanta. And um, also, in my spare time, I am the co-coordinator for the online peer mediation platform, which I'm going to give a plug to as an ACR uh, JAMS uh, Foundation program that we founded back in 2014. So now I want to introduce my colleague, Monica. Hello, everyone. As everyone has mentioned, um, my name is Monica Seeley. I have three amazing children. Um, I love potting plants and being creative. Uh, I have been in education for years. My passion is um, to cultivate lives through education and student leadership training. I am the project manager for Peace Patrol at Peace Peddlers. I am currently the graduation coach, college and career, and peer leader coordinator at um, high school in Rockdale County, and I absolutely love what I do. <laughs> awesome, as you can see, we have a phenomenal team, and we know that those of you who are on with today, that your background are representative of different areas. And we want to hear uh, who you are and what we can do and how we can provide you of support. So again, as Jeremy mentioned, feel free to utilize the chat so that we can get to know our audience much better and answer any questions that you have. So we'll hold on on, on that interactive component and go to the next slide. And so we want to know what you want to get out of today's presentation. But before we do that, I want to share with you the current landscape of our student population nationwide. And this is the knowledge, this is the piece in which we are able to see where our students are and what they are navigating through and how that connects to restorative justice, to peace building and to serving as educators within the landscape that we are all a part of. So currently nationwide, we have 437,283 children that are in foster care as of September, 2018. As it pertains to our youth who are exposed to trauma, including community violence, including sexual abuse, 25 to 43% of our youth are experiencing some sort of trauma. And typically, our youth are experiencing it at least two times. In addition to that, our youth are exposed to disasters that are less than uh, the traumatic experiences. However, whenever they are exposed to a disaster, it can impact 2.5% billion children in the past decade. This is prior to COVID. So when you look at those uh, pieces of information and you do not include the impact of COVID, you can see how a lot of our students are disadvantaged. But there's more. Almost a quarter of our United States children live in single parent households. And 
as it pertains to poverty, nearly 13 million children, that's almost 18%, are living in poverty with below 26,000 as income for a four person household. Youth homicide is approximately 84% of the victim as well as the perpetuator being a male student. 42% of boys and 37% of girls are exposed to bullying. Now looking at our climate, looking at the social unrest, looking at all of the impacts of the global pandemic, racism itself affects our children before they're even born, according to the Society for Adolescents and Health and Medicine, showing that our children who are of color are living in a constant situation of stress due to racial biases and that trigger their body subconscious to be either in a fight mode or in a flight mode. On top of that, with COVID now being a part of our 2020 year, COVID has impacted 1.5 billion students who were out of school, who are now engaging in digital learning or are trying to see if they're going to do the blended model of hybrid in which they're going to be working in school some days of the week and then home the other days of the week. So why do we share all of this information? It's being shared with us so we understand the landscape. When we talk about peace building and when we talk about peacekeeping practices, when we're talking about restorative justice, when we're talking about the educational traditional context, we are at a disadvantage if we look at our students and we look at these settings just as the people and separate the experiences that they are undergoing at this current time. In addition to that, when we look at tools, which Monica will be able to share with you, the tools that we implement can have a starting point of just one action step being taken from today's presentation. But it is introspective first. Why is that the case? Because many of our children are, in, are actually experiencing the traumatic experiences they are going through and navigating through COVID and digital learning landscapes, but they aren't the ones who initiated it. More than likely, their parents who are the adults are the ones who are the initiators, which means that we as adults, as a community of adults, have to look at what we are doing and reflecting about what we are doing so that we can then provide safe spaces that are peacekeeping spaces for our students and for the children in our communities and in our school settings. So at this time, it is a pleasure to have Monica come and she's going to share some tools that we can go ahead and utilize so that we can institute peacekeeping methods within our school settings. And as she shares on our Peace Patrol peacekeeping program, feel free to gather your questions so that we can have that rich dialogue when we finish this presentation, keeping in mind of the state of our children, the state of our youth in these United States of America. Hey, hello everyone. So my part as the project manager, and I also work with the students because that's my strength. Um, I am a demonstrator. Um, I believe in application, applying what they have learned and the information they're getting and their training and giving them opportunities to apply what they have learned. So that is my strength. We are in the trenches. We are are in the front line of our school, being a part, working with administrators, working with teachers. So we provide peer support, we provide teacher support, our program, and we support and provide support to our administrators. Can you believe that, students? So this program, and I'm gonna talk about the, the meaning, but I wanted to um, say this, with our program, it is student-centered. 
So I always tell the students, it's not about me, it's about you. And how the program grows and how it continues, it continues to grow by what they do, by their training. And so they interview their peers. So once they have graduated from high school, they interview their peers. All right, so we can move on to the next slide. All right, so how does this come into play? I believe that it's important that the school is a part of the community. I think it takes the um, family, schools, the community, all of us coming together to strengthen and make changes, positive changes, and the more students see the skills and um, restorative peace, peacekeeping skills, the more that it will become a part of the culture and that's how they will um, respond. So restorative practices, restores communities, schools and society at large. When we train students, I'm sorry, that's okay, with restorative skills practices to handle their own crisis over time, it will positively change our schools, communities, society at large to live peacefully. Next slide. So I wanted to share this chart that I have found, and I think it's very key. And as um, Ms. Dunson has stated in her introduction, in her part, where it's very important. And when we talk about our program, we start with the student first. They have to apply it to themselves. It can't be that I'm perfect and everybody else, they have the issue. We start with the student. So it's important for them to learn the skills and apply it to their own lives for change. So when we look at um, risk factors, um, we look at the domains where it has um, peer, the individual, the school, the family, the community, we are all connected. So whether we are in schools or we are in the community and we're serving um, families, we all need to be in the same room as we are in the Zoom meeting, having these conversations and see how we can support one another and how we can come together to help serve the students and the families in which we live in. Okay. So what is Peace Patrol? A peacekeeping program. Hold on, my screen is being blocked. It where I can see all of the words. Okay, a peacekeeping program for middle and high schools. That's the first step of a holistic approach to create peaceful schools and communities. The goal of Peace Patrol is to reduce the likelihood of conflict escalation while cultivating an environment for a positive peace. Peace Patrol empowers students with the knowledge and skills to become peacekeepers in their schools. So um, here are our peer leaders, our Peace Patrol um, leaders with um, one of our superintendents, the former superintendent at our school and our resource officer. So we do work with the resource officer in our school. Next slide, please. All right, so in our training, we have four core areas for Peace Patrol training. And also they have additional training as well. All of our students are mandated reporters. They also learn um, I messages, what else, um, conflict resolution, um, different, different ones. Cynthia, you could jump in what they, what they learn as well. She also trains some of the students. But let me start with this. So our first um, training is observation. Students are trained to observe potential conflict situations by entering areas where they, are, they most often occur and establish positive relationships in schools. So in the hallways, the bathroom, um, they, they patrol the hallway and, and this is a class. So the students are getting credit 
So they have a class with me and during that time, they help and they assist to make sure that um, students, there are no conflicts in between class changes. So in this training, they learn um, how is observation vital in a crisis? What is situational awareness? Elements of situational awareness. All right, so this is part of their training. Also, intervention. Students are trained and equipped to disrupt potential conflicts from escalating by identifying, alerting disputants to their presence. So in this training, they learn what is prevention, what is intervention, what does the research say about peer-to-peer -peer connectedness, how to approach a student um, in crisis, what skills do students have to intervene in a conflict? So once again, there are some other skills they have learned. Like I said, they are mandated uh, reporters. They learn problem solving. And we do a lot of role play, role play, role play, role play. So in our training, we create scenarios, um, scenarios and how they would respond to a situation. Also, they have learned how to develop a prevention plan. So we do a lot of planning and we meet um, in how we can improve what's going on in our school and how we develop those plans. We work with our administrators to see look at the data, see what, what are the issues, what, what is the location or um, where most of these incidents are occurring. And you guys probably will know this, but a lot of it is in the bath bathroom. There is no supervision. There, there aren't any cameras in there. So that's an area that we do frequent and we put out a lot of information in the bathroom just in case students need support. All right, next slide. And so a part of our training is facilitation. Students facilitate Oh, see, the intervention process by assisting the disputants in resolving the situation peacefully. So why facilitation? To empower students to become peacemakers, peacekeepers, and peace builders. How does facilitation look? This is a part of the training. How to facilitate the dispute, disputants in resolving their issue, their situation peacefully. Methods used in facilitation. So we also use brainstorming. We train them how to go through that process. So one of the methods, brainstorming. Okay, next slide, please. Right, and our fourth area is oversight. Students provide oversight by following up with students to ensure they receive the services or um, assistance that was needed. Why oversight? To ensure students are getting additional support to decrease the chances the student repeating the same behavior of choices. How do you follow up with students? So we go through that and then we provide resources to the students. Next slide. Okay, let's see. Did you want me to play with this? Oops. Yes, wait, please. <laughs> <laughs> All right. oh, sorry about that. Um, sometimes Boom doesn't want to do a video very well, but if you want to tell them who these people are that are popping across their screen, screen that might be helpful. <laughs> so these are our um, peer leaders, um, our Peace Patrol um, leaders, and so we call it the power of peace or the power of the peers. So this is when this picture shows when we are doing new student orientation and we wanna welcome new students to our school to help them to get adjusted and so they won't feel alone. We have students who come from another state and we want them to feel welcome. And we partner um, the students, our peer leaders, our Peace Patrol leaders with um, new students. So the minimum, uh, 
they do three sessions with the new students, but we feel that if they need more, they will continue with that student throughout the school year. Okay. All right, so these are some of our activities that we do. I just stated the one about the new student orientation, and then we do classroom advisement with all grade levels. So we do touch on our um, social emotional awarenesses that we have. We um, touch on um, different topics pertaining to staying in school, being safe. Also, um, this is new for us, because this is where everything is virtual. So we have started an additional new program. It's called Peer Virtual Teacher Assistant. The Peace Patrol leaders assist the teacher vir virtually. They assist the teacher to manage the chat box, take attendance, and a, um, a timekeeper. Now remember, they have a class, so they're not missing out on their work. Okay, and then we have the PBIS. They are the liaison for our school, and that's our positive behavioral intervention um, and support. So the Peace Patrol, they collaborate with administrators with um, building a positive behavior plan for our school. We do, um, they do lunch socials. So the mission for the lunch social is to have a positive place to grow, learn, and make new acquaintances. Once again, we look at the data in, of our school and we listen to the students. And so some students, they may eat lunch by themselves. They don't know anyone. So we wanted to create a safe space where they can meet other students and we do activities with them. And as I said before, we do the um, social emotional awareness each month, okay? All right, so this is one of our Peace Patrol leader, Kirk, he's a ninth grader. And his comment was, Peace Patrol training taught me when someone is in need, how to help, how to help them in every situation. Is that word there? Okay. So thank you, Monica. So we're just gonna sum up um, a little bit about who Peace Peddlers is. And Peace, uh, Peace Patrol is part of our Peace Peddler organization. And it is really what we like to refer to as the tip of the spear in changing generations. That is part of our goal in Peace, Peace Peddlers is to change the upcoming generation. Unfortunately, we haven't done a very good job up to this point. And so we want to really make sure that um, we help schools and train them to reduce violence. And Peace Patrol is one of those programs because we know we just have a very short window of time where students are still malleable, they're still willing to change, they're still willing to listen. Uh, they're not like us adults where we get just, we get into that polarization like we talked about earlier. Um, but we really believe that we can change this next generation to handle conflicts and restore each other back to community um, better than we can. Um, so, just want to kind of just cover very quickly what our programs are. Peace Patrol is a, um, has, is a free program, but it also has a paid program. So, we would like to offer anyone out there part of our free training um, for our program if you're interested or you know of a school that might be interested in, in taking this program. And Monica, Antoinette, and I would be willing to work with them and, and help them uh, to create that program in their school. So just as a review, this is what Peace Patrol is, it's a peacekeeping program um, to help reduce conflict and restore people back in school. But we have other programs uh, in Peace Pillars. We're creating a pre-K through 12 curriculum called Power Up. Um, and this is our Power Up curriculum. It's K through 12 uh, with a educator guide. Um, and you can also go to our website, which I will share that with you, um, Jeremy, so that you can have that. And if you want to share that, that'd be great. Uh, we have a Peacemaker program, which is our peer mediation online program that we are currently um, will be up and running pretty soon. Uh, we have a Peace Restored program by the wonderful Pris Prutzman. Uh, this is our restorative uh, facilitation program that we are actually uh, promoting for teachers, um, which will be online, by the way. And our STAR program, that is going to be our crisis training when it, we actually have a crisis going on, like a school shooting or a situation that's happened, we will send in a group of people to help that community. Um, and that's also part of a restorative 
practices program that we have because we know once a tragedy happens, trauma happens, there has to be that res restoring the community back to order. And then the last one, which we're really excited about is our peace officer program. And this one is where we're using trauma informed training to train police officers how to react better with community members and students. So we're really excited about that. Um, and that will be forthcoming as well. So how can you get involved? Well, we um, have volunteer positions. If you have a, uh, if you are professor and you have some people that would, would like to do an internship with us, we are opening up our doors for interns. We have two right now who are fantastic. Um, you could help support a school campaign or you can just, um, you know, just become a partner if you want. And so these are our partners currently. We're really a new organization. And so Southern Methodist, Kennesaw State, and Fresno have joined the board uh, to send us wonderful interns and to provide um, just ways to partner with each other. So we're really super excited about that. Um, but that's a little bit about us. And so we don't want to take any more time. So we will open up for questions if anybody has any questions or we can wait to the end if we want to do that. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, thank you for for a presentation for your presentation. And if you can send the website just on the chat box, maybe people can get can see it there. Um, and and if you if you're okay with it, I'll say let's let's save the questions for the end and connect it to what others are speaking about as well. Unless there's Sounds anything wonderful. burning that somebody wants to ask. Sounds um, great. Thank you. So great. So our next presenter is Dr. Ellen Keys from Notre Dame. Um, and her talk is entitled uh, Conflict Resolution Education and Ingredient of Restorative Justice. So I will pass off to you, uh, Dr. Keyes. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Let me try that again. I will first of all say my, now, my name is Ellen Kies, and I direct a program called Take 10, which is out of the University of Notre Dame. And I am trying to put my PowerPoint up, but I'm not succeeding so far, even though I'm doing what I normally do when I do this. So bear with me for a second. I'm going to tell you while I try to do this and see if I can multitask a little bit about what Take 10 is. Similar to the previous presenters, Take 10 works with kids and now with adults to teach them conflict resolution skills. We actually were first a program in the city of Chicago in the early 90s. We wanted to teach kids how to de-escalate the conflict that was in their lives. And we first started with a slogan campaign, which was talk it out, walk it out, wait it out. And when that program moved to Notre Dame about 20 years ago, my predecessor and several of the graduate students and undergrads who were part of the work did some research to see who was also teaching kids conflict resolution skills and how to do it well and how to take the work that we had done and transform kids lives. So they researched who was teaching conflict resolution across the United States and in parts of Europe as well and found out from that research that there was a successful way to teach conflict resolution to kids. And they leaned on Dan Olvaeus' work. They leaned on the states of Ohio and Maryland who were putting conflict resolution into their state educational standards. And through those partnerships, they developed our current curriculum. One of the things that I found out when I took this job 13 and a half years ago was that they kept saying, Take 10 was developed as a restorative practice. Take 10 was developed as a restorative practice. And I read that and read that and read that. And my old background as an attorney did not tell me what the heck that meant. So I had to do a lot of reading and a lot of digging to find out what a restorative practice was. And that all led me to restorative justice. And I found out that we were developed as a restorative practice under the bigger umbrella of restorative justice because Restorative justice seeks to repair harm. Restorative justice seeks to build community. Restorative justice leads to better relationships. And if you can develop practices to cause less harm, you're halfway there. And that's why we did what we did, was to 
help school age kids and over time help other adults in our community and adults in the lives of the kids develop practices so that when they were involved in the inevitable daily conflicts that happen, those conflicts did not evolve into violent outcomes. So we spend a lot of time with kids talking about conflict and talking about violence and telling them what they need to know as far as the skills that you need to deal with conflict. And so Take 10 has become a curriculum of conflict resolution education. And now I have to confess that I have not figured out how to share my screen and put my PowerPoint up. So if somebody who is in the moderating part of this conversation can direct me, I will happily do it because what I normally do is certainly not functioning. When I look in the settings, it looks like you have the ability. I'm not sure what, um, why you're not able to. If you want, you can email them to me and I can try to share because it looks like I have that capability. If that would help. Ellen, do you have your PowerPoint already pulled up or are you, I mean, is it already visual, visually available? It was, it was. Let me, let me go okay. back to it and maybe that will solve my problem. Yeah, and- And, and I appreciate your help because heaven knows um, some days things just don't go, go according to plan. Yeah, I'll just say last night we had a, we had a session and I had, I was sharing our slides for my group and then I put it in screen share and it did, they would not be able to see it in screen share. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that normally is what happens. <laughs> so let me, um, let me try one more time and see if I can make it show. And I do apologize. Yes, I can probably talk about Take 10 for, you know, all day. But I think you all would rather see the slides than just my face talking. So we'll... Um... We'll see if I can make this work. I think maybe it's going to work now. Can you see my slides now? Somebody talk to me. Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So I, I said that and then nobody said anything. I'm like, okay, maybe it's only working for me. You know, here I sit in my house in South Bend, Indiana, having put my, um, my boyfriend and my dog and my daughter on mute so that I can do this. And uh, then I can't talk to anybody. Okay, well, that is something that I've probably already said. The fact that we have a vision to improve school climate has been true from the beginning, from our start almost 20 years ago. And we have been working to do that in different ways ever since. But basically, as I think I summed up a minute ago, Take 10 is an evidence-based conflict resolution education program. It is born out of the elements of restorative justice, and it provides both youth and adults positive alternatives to violence. Our motto has always been talk it out, walk it out, wait it out since our inception back in the city of Chicago before it migrated to Notre Dame and ever since, and ever since we got here. I remind everyone of the seven core assumptions of restorative justice. I know that this is not RJ 101. I know that this is how we take RJ and help improve school climate. But I think it's always good to sort of refocus on these assumptions because these assumptions are essential to anything that we do under that umbrella. And I'm not going to read the slide to you because that's actually one of my pet peeves in life is people who just read their slides to me. So I will let you read them all, but I will remind you most specifically of number seven is that within restorative justice, we need practices in order to build the habits of living from the core self. And the core self is the most essential part of RJ. So Take 10 developed as a practice of restorative justice fits squarely within the core assumptions that are essential to RJ. So I just sort of bring that up as a reminder, as, a, as the founding grounding place of restorative justice are these concepts, these assumptions, and sometimes when we work with youth and with adults, 
and we talk about these beliefs, they're just almost shocked because they've not heard these things before. They don't believe that their true self is good and wise and powerful. No one's ever told them that before. They've had no reason to believe that before. So we can be rather world altering if we start getting the kids we work with and the adults we work with to believe some different things about themselves. And then we're working to build a practice with them, a practice of living that reduces the conflict and helps them de-escalate the conflicts that they encounter. As I said, we are first and foremost a curriculum. And the curriculum is built in this order. One of the things that our old research taught us was that this is the order to teach things in. This is how you build the skills, how you build the confidence in the kids, is teaching them these skills and teaching them these skills in this order. We start at ground zero, whether we are working with kindergartners or eighth graders or 12th graders or parents or other adults, by talking about what the words conflict and violence mean. And we help people understand that conflict is part of life because conflict is just a disagreement. And you're a unique human being. You have your own perspective and it is different from the perspective of other people. So of course you're gonna disagree with folks. It happens and that's okay. Conflict is okay. It's what we do with the conflict that matters. And the skills that we teach help you resolve your conflicts in a nonviolent way. And then we go from there. What is violence? We paint that word with a very broad brush. It is not just physical harm, but it is mental, psychological, verbal harm as well. So that you can become aware of the violence that you may commit. Even if you would be somebody who says, well, I'm not violent. I never put my hands on anybody. Well, okay, maybe you never put your hands on anybody, but that doesn't mean that you haven't harmed them. A group of middle school girls is usually a great example of people who have harmed others without laying a finger on them. When she was in middle school, my daughter would call them the popular girls in just that particular tone that middle school girls can use. And we all know who she meant. In different buildings, it's different girls, but it might be cheerleaders, it might be volleyball players, and it might be groups that I would never think to profile. But we all know who they are, and we know that they sometimes have caused harm to others. So we help kids kind of get in line with those definitions as our starting point. We talk through and we spend a lot of time on values and principles. And for those of you who are restorative justice folks who may conduct circles, you certainly know the time that's necessary to spend in building values, talking about values, and then talking about how you derive your life principles from those values. And then we take a walk through the rest of those skills in that order. We spend a lot of time talking about effective communication. One of the courses that I teach is nonviolent communication, so we draw a lot from that work and pull it into what we do. We talk about fair and assertive behavior and sort of that continuum of behavior from aggressive on one side and passive on the other and that lovely middle ground and assertive and how you get there and the sparks that fly when you bring those two ends around and you have passive aggressive meeting up together. We talk about emotion recognition, anger control. We talk a lot about problem solving skills. And um, when you were talking about brainstorming and working with kids and teaching them the brainstorming process, since brainstorming is one of the elements of problem solving, I had to smile because we've certainly worked with a lot of people on how to brainstorm well and not shut other people down and build ideas and build concepts and then make some good choices from all the things that you've talked about. This curriculum began with school-aged kids. That was how it was built. It was built K through 12, and it still is K through 12, but because we do evaluation and research every year, we realized that we couldn't just focus on kids because when we started talking to kids about why they believed things different from what we taught them and why they acted on things differently than what we taught them, 
they talked a lot about expectations of parents and aunts and uncles and grandparents and brothers and sisters and people at home and people who were raising them. And all of that work let us realize that we needed to work with adults too. Because if you don't work with adults, you aren't reaching the whole picture. Or if you yourself work with kids, it's a great idea to try to partner with other people in your community who are going to be working with adults on those same concepts. So we developed an adult program. We borrowed from our high school curriculum and changed the scenarios and changed the role plays and changed the discussion points to things that were more pertinent to work life and to relationships and to parenting. But the concepts, that list of things in our curriculum remained the same and still does. Something else that we developed over time in knowing that we were a practice, a restorative practice, and my honestly, my delving more into becoming a circle keeper and keeping a lot of RJ circles in our community was to realize that there was value to be gained in teaching our own curriculum in a circle process. So we do that. We teach kids in circle. We teach adults in circle. You can teach our entire curriculum, all the chapters in circle. We have laid out circle plans for our less experienced circle keepers, but you can teach all of Take 10 in a restorative justice circle. So that was kind of our full circle, pun intended, movement within what we do to go from we knew we were a restorative practice to evolving into you can actually teach our whole curriculum in the practice of a circle, in the work of a circle. And so that's been a great way um, as restorative justice and education has come more fully into the South Bend schools, it has enabled us to work closely with a lot of schools in the community who are trying to bring RJ into their doors as, as a way to build community in academic ways and in ways to help deal with discipline. So it's nice to have that piece come together. I wanna to talk a little bit more about the adult work because the adults are the underpinning for the kids. And way back in the day, before I even lived in Indiana, I, I was a facilitator for nurturing parent education curriculum. And one of the things that I learned from that curriculum is that you're most effective when the kids and the adults learn the same thing at the same time so that they can implement it together. Because if you as a parent learn a different way to deal with conflict and you try to carry that out at home and the kids don't know what in the heck you're talking about, you may struggle. But if you've been able to teach the kids and the adults the same things and the same skills, to work conflict out in a more peaceful way than you've done before, you have a greater chance of success. So this is just a quick list of the way that we have worked with adults. And the picture that you see is myself and she was an AmeriCorps member then, she's become a very close friend since then. We are standing with a group of incarcerated men who just completed doing circles with us. We were having a celebratory dinner with them in the cafeteria where they're incarcerated. We learned that we'll kind of take adults wherever they'll let us come do it. And yes, I like to be more strategic than that. But you know, sometimes when you work in the community, your strategy goes out the window when you realize who was willing to work with you and who just isn't. And so we started building. We started building. Some nonprofits said, I'd like you to come teach this stuff about conflict resolution to my staff. They could sure use better conflict resolution skills than what they've got. So we, we do that. And sometimes it was local nonprofits who house adults and kids. And they said, yeah, we, we'll have you come work with the kids. And then after a session or two with just the kids, they came to realize, well, yeah, you were right. This would be better if you worked with the adults and the kids. So at places like the Center for the Homeless and Hope Mission, which here in our community are the two homeless facilities that we've got, 
And we also now do it at the Robinson Community Learning Center, which is actually where my office is located. We are a community center that Notre Dame built and staffs. We were, and we provide a lot of um, educational programming and tutoring for local youth. Well, we started there working with both our kids and their parents. At the YWCA, which is the domestic violence shelter in our community, they house adults and kids. So it was a natural fit to work with adults and kids there. The two places that are listed at the bottom are the two places where I have worked with incarcerated men and taught them conflict resolution skills. And what I have always found interesting is that over and over again, when I have been with a group of incarcerated men talking about the skills that we teach, talking about restorative justice, I will be giving sort of an introductory, this is what we do, and I'll even maybe be doing our, our motto, the talk it out, walk it out, wait it out. And I'll talk about how you need to take 10 deep breaths, or you need to count to 10, or you need to take 10 steps away from a person before you interact to deal with your conflict. And I have several times had one of the men interrupt me to say something like, yeah, because if you don't, the police show up and you walk away in bracelets. And it's a very grounded way to show that they get it. And many of them have expressed to me that they wish they'd known these skills when they were younger. So that work is important to support the work that we do with kids. Because kids don't live in a vacuum. Kids don't operate in a vacuum. Kids live in a world peopled with adults, adults they care about, adults who set the standards for them one way or the other. And we'd like to be part of the standards that the adults set. So we work with kids and we work with adults. The one thing I want to say about incarcerated men, we, are, we have a new component. And it is new enough that I can't tell you much about it yet, but it stems from our work with incarcerated men. Because in addition to teaching Take 10 and teaching restorative justice to incarcerated men, uh, Notre Dame and Holy Cross College have a program that teaches, it is a degree granting program for incarcerated men at a prison about an hour away. And I teach there as well as on our campuses. And over and over and over again, I have met incarcerated men who desperately want to work with youth, who desperately want to find a way to change the life trajectory of, I think, who they see as their younger selves. And then one of the people who directs that program said, oh, they all say that. But once they get out, they don't bother to do it. And that sort of flip response made me want to look into this more because I, thought, I don't think that's it. I really don't think that, that she's correct. So I started looking into it and I started to get to know some of the men better and got to know the ones who'd gotten out better and discovered that they very much want to, but they very much are not usually allowed to do it. Just like their backgrounds are used against them in employment and housing and benefits, their backgrounds are used against them in working with youth too. So over the last year, we have created a way to allow the formerly incarcerated to work with the most at-risk youth in our community. Because the kids in the community who are already in the school to prison pipeline need mentors who understand them. They need mentors who they'll listen to. And as many of you probably know, the average youth mentor looks kind of like me a middle-aged white woman who may have the best heart and the best motives in the entire world. But if she'll admit it, is probably scared of the kids who most need the mentoring. My formerly incarcerated mentors have the exact opposite reaction. They are most drawn to these kids. These are the kids they most want to help. These are the kids who they can see parts of themselves at 15 and 16 in. So we are just getting this program off the ground. As you can probably imagine, it took us a lot.
to get the university's green light, to get risk management's green light, to get some of the schools to give us a green light. And some of that is still being massaged, but we are in a good place. COVID has very much slowed us down, um, but it has also given us a chance to do some more training and to develop some more training with our mentors because this will be restorative justice based. They are learning to be restorative justice facilitators and use circles in addition to one-on-one -on -one mentoring with the kids we'll mentor. So we're taking COVID as a blessing. We're just going to adjust our attitudes in that way and determine that we are going to mentor these kids when we can with incredibly well-trained mentors who have been able to do a lot of online RJ stuff in a, that's headquartered in states that we wouldn't have the budget to send them to. So we're just going to take that as, as a blessing. That is sort of the, the roundup of what we do in Take 10. I mentioned that we do research and evaluation and we do research and evaluation every year. Part of being part of a university is that we have faculty members, postdocs, graduate students and the like who work with us on our annual evaluation so that we can demonstrate our impact. And we know with years worth of evaluation results that we do improve the knowledge and the attitudes and the behaviors of the kids we serve. And we've been able to show in most recent years that the schools where we use Take 10 in a restorative justice format have a slightly higher degree of improvement than the schools where we don't. So the evaluation supports and backs up what we do. And this is the one place where I will say that COVID did not help us because we did not get to do end of year data last school year because all of a sudden there was no end of year. All of a sudden everybody stopped, everybody went poof, all my college kid volunteers went home and we weren't doing anything except sit in my family room like I am now and teach remotely. So I don't have data for the last school year because of the way that we had to end. But we are back in action. We have made videos. We are zooming into classrooms. We are doing what we need to do to stay alive during COVID and to pull people together because we understand that the relationship building that we're all about is probably more important now because people feel so incredibly disjointed from themselves. And that's just me. That's who I am, that's where I am, that's my number and my email address and our website. So if anybody has any questions or things they want to take up with me that wouldn't really be cool in this format right now, here is a way to get a hold of me should you like. And I'm open to questions now or later if that suits anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think if there's no pressing questions, let's let's move on to our last presentation and we can come back and I'm seeing connections between these very much anyway. So hopefully there'll be so. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat box if you'd like and we, we can kind of keep track of them and come back as we as we finish up our last presentation. And I apologize for for uh, destroying your name and I won't try to destroy Grajina's last name. Uh, I'll let her do that herself. <laughs> I'll let her tell her name herself, but um, let me just introduce her. She's coming from around the world in a, in a different place, and so she can speak to that. Um, and her t the title of her talk is Guiding Student-Teacher Conflict Transformation, the Student Perspective. So, hello everyone. Uh, I, 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 can you share my can you see my slides? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I am Grezina, and my uh, second last name is Chuladiena. So, sounds different as I am from Lithuania. Uh, I can show you it, my country, on, uh, on the slide. So, I can see. So, Lithuania is in Northeast Europe and is bordered by Latvia to north, Belarus to east and uh, south, Poland to the south, Kaliningrad Oblast to the southwest, 
and Lithuania is a small country and has an estimated population of 2.8 million people as of 2019. So I apologize for my poor English as it's, only, it's the fourth uh, language on my list of languages I'm trying to speak. So sorry for this difficulties in pronunciation of these languages. Uh, so I'm going, uh, so uh, uh, my presentation is different from the previous one as I'm not speaking about programs, I'm speaking about the need of that kind of programs and uh, uh, the need for teachers as well to learn conflict resolution. So student-teacher conflicts are inevitable components of school reality. Although the ideal pattern is sustained low level of student-teacher conflict and a high, high level of student-teacher closeness, research indicates that on average, one in seven students engages in moderate high level conflictual interactions with, with teachers. In classrooms uh, where students uh, indicate more student teacher conflicts, students report disliking for more of their peers and more aggressive behavior. Students who experience conflicts with teacher are viewed by peers as more vulnerable or more warranted targets of victimization. Teachers who experience high levels of conflict in the relationships with their students are likely to develop unhealthy classroom, classroom level self-efficacy beliefs in the teaching domains of classroom management and instructional strategies. Destructive conflict experience with an individual student may yield internalized and relatively stable patterns of predominantly negative beliefs, feelings, and expectations about the self as a teacher and the students in the relationships. I will. So, research in broad classroom climate literature has development, has recognized the importance of positive student teacher relationships on children's development. However, building and maintaining supportive relationship with all students may not be always easy for teachers. So sometimes teachers engage in conflictual behavior, uh, which might have worsened their relationships with children. Reducing teacher-child conflict may be more difficult than increasing closeness. Student-teacher conflicts need to be studied to improve their management and prevention. So the present study has inquired into justice-related conflict issues. Justice is set out to be a key issue in conflict interaction. The study of student perception of unfairness helped to understand how students adjust to the demands of the surrounding world. Investigating teacher behavior affecting student well-being is important due to the applica application in preparing and training teachers. If teachers want to act in a just manner, they must know both 
which behavior is experienced as just and as unjust by students, and what principles of just attribution do students apply. Much education research concerns achievement and participation, but less effort has been put into considering how to promote experiences of fairness and how to recognize success or failure in this. So the present study seeks to, uh, to rectify this situation by examining a relationship between perception of justice and conflicting behavior. Uh, justice judgment, the role of injustice and justice in educational settings has recently been, been more frequently examined. Students who feel justly treated by their teachers are more likely to accept and adhere the school rules and norms, uh, give higher evaluations on the teacher. Justice experience correlates strongly and positively to school climate and trust. It shapes, shapes the development of personal belief in justice world and contrary conflicts Concerning distributive, procedural, and interpersonal injustice at school may be important in causing distress at school. Unjustly treated students are more likely to express bullying behavior. Indirect interpersonal aggression and hostility toward their teachers and to resist teachers' requests through revenge and deception. So this study aims to find out what issues of injustice arise during student teacher conflicts and the research questions are such as what types of injustice do students perceive in various student teacher conflicts what issues arise during student-teacher conflicts? What unjust events can be characterized as most typical in student-teacher conflicts? Uh, the data from students was collected from in, in a class of optional course Fundamentals of Conflict Studies at Mikos Romers University. I'm lecturing this, uh, delivering this course at the university, this optional course. Participation in the study was voluntary and students had time in class to complete the task. The respondents consist of a total of 68 graduates and postgraduate students. Their average age was approximately 25. The instrumentation and procedures replicated those of Horan and colleagues where a questionnaire format was employed. Participants were asked to recall the student teacher conflict they experienced at school. The conflict memories form included free space for description of conflict situation and questions to collect the following information. Uh, what did the teacher say to do, uh, or do which made a respondent treat this behavior unfair? How did a respondent feel after this unfair act? How did a respondent react to this unfairness? For the purpose of this study, conflict descriptions were analyzed and grouped according to 
types of perceived injustice. In accordance to theoretical background, conflict issues that were classified into three groups according to types of perceived, uh, perceived injustice. Horan and colleagues, classroom justice definitions were used to classify, uh, classify participants' responses. Distributive justice variations occurred when students perceived that the outcome or resource distributed by the opponent was by Tita was unfair. Procedural justice variations were times in which students perceived their teachers used unfair class related processes. Interactional justice variations were defined as instances in which students perceived their opponent uh, teachers communicated in an unfair manner, describing valuations involving interactional injustice. The, uh, the classification proposed by, by Scordney is referred to. The classification identifies three types of aggression, offensive, damaging, and humiliating. And th 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 that's the result of the study. So, although it has been frequently documented that fairness benefits both the students and the teacher, uh, the research call attention to the importance of fairness in the classroom. The results of the real studies indicate that feeling of injustice at educational settings are not rare. This study aiming examining of experiences of student teacher conflicts su su supports these findings. Students observed that their teachers were unfair when administering grades, opportunities, punishment, and attention. Students' grades being perceived as unfairly distributed occurred more frequently than opportunity to improve grade, opportunity to make a task or punishment, lack of information and feedback. Students felt the teacher was unfair by comparing for example, the grade to other students received the grade, or and by evaluating and comparing it to efforts expended. Expectations to grade students felt they deserved. Student teacher conflicts in grading situations when students feel that they are the victims of unfair grading seem to be one of the most typical events in students' conflict memories. Continue with procedure. Uh, there were as well conflicts over unfair of procedures while administering of goods. Within the theme procedural injustice, five sub-themes were developed. Not following through class policies, not same requirement for all while implementing class policies, teacher error, lack of information for task, lack of feedback. Valuations involving interactional injustice included teacher communication in offensive manner or and insulting and testing students in front of others. 
interactional injustice variations consist of aggressive behavior, offensive, humiliating, and damaging. These findings support the significance of satisfying students' relational needs and managing their face concern. Secondly, remembered conflicts were classified according to type of unfair behavior. Prototypical situations or events which elicit the sense of injustice were used for this analysis. The behavior patterns occurring in conflict situations were classified according to the classification system, system developed by Mikula, Petri, and Tanzer. Researchers defined 22 types of events, examples, which had elicited a sense of injustice. All the types describe the context within which injustice feelings arise. Mikula and colleagues suggested clustering the 22 categories into eight general types of unjust event. The cluster labeled as letting somebody down contains breaking agreements and disregarding others' feelings, needs, and desires, and taking advantage of a partner, not doing one's share. The cluster concerning lack of loyalty includes various insincerity forms, betraying confidences, talking behind somebody's back, Lay, lie, lie, lying and lacking acceptance, poking fun at another person, reproaching, accusing. The other cluster includes selfish behavior. One more cluster relates to events where adults exercised or tried to exercise influence and power. This cluster is made up from med meddling, leading a person on a string of punishment. One more cluster combines cheating and stealing. The next cluster includes all events relating to unfriendly, impolite and aggressive treatment of people. The cluster Arbit arbitrariness uh, relates mainly to procedural and partly also to distributional issues and combines arbitrariness of superiors and fair grading, failure to recognize performance or efforts. Finally, goods and benefits distributions Forcing, focusing more strongly on the social comparative feature than on events just mentioned, constituted an independent cluster. So the eight cluster solution depicts a meaningful grouping of lower level clusters and provides hints as to the main injustice types that occur in different uh, accounters and relationships. Each type's frequency in the present data is also presented in figure. I will show you this figure. Data reveal that arbitrariness and goods and benefits distribution 
are the most nominated and dust event types in the 67 Lithuanian students sample. So figure contains frequencies of certain unfair teacher behavior. The most frequently reported unfair behavior in this case is as well grading situations. 40% of teacher student conflict cases. Uh, so, teacher student conflicts in grading situations when students feel that they are victims of unfair grading seem, seem to be one of the most typical in event in student conflict memories. Behavioral reactions labeled as demonstration of power and superiority was reported less frequently than grading. This action was mentioned in almost, almost one-fourth of reported conflicts. And the teacher's unfair accusation was identified in almost a fifth of cases, 17%. Almost every tenth teacher-student conflict referred to the teacher's actions which were perceived by students as unjust or unfair whenever the teacher disregarded a student's feeling, needs, and desires, put his hair interest first, was unfriendly or aggressive toward the students, did not admit this to students' errors, was partial, lacked recognizing a student's performance or efforts, or treated a student arbitrarily. The findings are in line with those of prior studies. The most frequently experienced and just events in Mikula and colleagues study, sampling, uh, a sample comprising 280 students, uh, were reproached accusations. With, sample, with a sample comprising 233 students from 1st, 7th and 9th grade from various schools throughout Israel, Israel Shvili reported experiences of power, arbitrariness of authority figures and distributions of good and benefits to be the most nominated and dust types. It is worthwhile to note that there were seven of 27, uh, 22 actions not cited in students' descriptions of teacher-student conflicts, such as cheating, stealing, meddling, lying, talking behind somebody's back, betraying confidences, and taking advantage of students. They as well were not underlined in Horan and colleague studies. So similar to Horan and colleague study, most indicated in this study teacher's behavior were related to how instructors graded classroom work assign assignment, assignments. The present study inquired into justice-related perceptions in educational settings by examining conflict issues. It was based upon the assertion that students describing their conflicts with teachers might provide an additional key to understanding how justice functions in the classroom. The study investigated what issues arise during teacher-student conflicts? What types of injustice do students perceive as in various teacher-student conflicts? What unjust events can be characterized as most typical in teacher-student conflicts? So the study indicated that students often perceived teachers' behavior as a source of student-teacher conflicts. Students reported that perceived teacher unfairness was the cause for their behavioral response 
and conflict escalation. The study supported the theoretical assumption that justice affects conflict behavior. This study revealed that perceived unfair grading, demonstrations of power and accusation were the most important predictors of teacher-student conflict. The investigation provides information on main types and clusters and just student-teacher conflicts based on, on of Mikula and co colleagues' conception. Among the various teacher misbehaviors reported in students' narratives were actions interpreted as unjust, arbitrariness, unfair good distributions, unfriendly or aggressive treatment, no loyalty, and letting students down. Moreover, conflicts are argued to be related to more than one classroom injustice type. Conflicts arguably, arguably become complex experience, complaints of distributive and or procedural and or interactional justice issues. Also, teacher-student conflicts demonstrate un unique variance in all three classroom justice types. They contributed most to explaining the variance in perceived interactional justice. The research highlights, highlighted the conflict resolution skills both for teachers and students to be critical for teacher-student justice conflict outcomes, which as prior research indicated, affect students' school careers. Teacher conflict behavior may be especially hurtful for students and experience to be unjust as well. According to Hori Asset and Powell, students respond to teachers' unfair treatment with behavior that inflicts a similar amount of harm on teachers as the students have experienced. In classroom practice, the findings suggest that in order to avoid destructive conflicts, teachers should be alert to students' understanding of justice. Investigating teachers' teacher behavior affecting students' student outcome is important in preparing and training teachers. If teacher wants to act in just a just manner, they must know which behavior is experienced as just and as unjust by their students. This can be achieved by considering the knowledge of the educational psychological justice research for teacher training and self-improvement. By applying this knowledge in the lessons and create, for example, an open discussion climate, which enables the student to express their opinions and feelings. And by complementing their own perspective with the perspective Perspective of their students. A general conclusion that may be drawn from the above study is uh, uh, that according to students' viewpoints, teachers may promote justice perceptions in classes by being less arbitrary, equitable in assessing individual and group results, showing impartiality in interacting with students and being more skilled in class conflict management. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation and real interesting connections between the three, the three groups. I'm just gonna call, call on people to either put questions in the chat box or 
feel free to chime in. Maybe I'll just kind of start with a, a broad question because all of the, the panels were, were focused in a way on training and making sure that, um, you know, training either students or in the, the last context, there's, a, there's an assumption there of kind of training teachers, right? And, and the transfer of knowledge of these conflict resolution skills and conflict resolution education um, and so I'd just like to hear, you know, whoever on the, on, on the, the speakers that have spoken, how, how you think um, this, I mean, and, and we've, we've been talking about it in different contexts as well. And so how you think this, this kind of work happens and can be effective in, um, in kind of whole systems, right? So institution, whether that's a full school institution, I mean, one of the groups mentioned PBIS, I've, I've worked in the Greensboro area and we have PBIS here and one of my critiques of PBIS is in its attempt to, to do a whole system approach to conflict and doesn't really build relationship right and so I'm just curious like what what people would say in terms of you know how to how to build the, how to transfer those skills maybe is the way to say it in kind of large systems um, and, we, you know, many of you talked about institutions, so I just thought that might be one way to open up. And, and please, others, feel free to chime in with, with questions um, as they're answering. And I'll try to either, either I'll try to voice them through if you want to put them in the chat, or if you just want to put a question mark in the chat, I'll then call on you and say, you know, turn on your mic and ask your question. So. Well, I'm interested in responding. Uh -huh. to that as far as spreading restorative justice throughout a larger structure. We've been working on doing that both within the South Bend School District and within the greater community of South Bend now for, oh, a good three or four years. Be and we started because we felt as if the discipline policies of the South Bend School District were not what they should be. And the South Bend schools were cited by the state of Indiana for disproportionality in their discipline against minorities. So that all came to a point where people who work for the school system and those of us who are at different universities and other community agencies here said, we need to do this better. And we know how. We've been doing this type of programming and we've been doing this type of research for years and we have come to similar findings. So let's put our heads together and come up with a way to influence discipline. And that's where bringing RJ into the schools really got a foothold, was they formed a leadership committee on restorative justice in education. They asked different ones of us to join it, to have input into the disciplinary processes of the school. We eventually created some positions at the district level that look at disproportionality, access for students, treatment of students, discipline, things like that that are supposed to, and they are having some impacts on the proportionality of discipline. The data are starting to go the way we want. Um, and we as a group have pushed the board a bit to create an RJ coordinator position for the entire school district. That was just put into effect within the summer. And now we are looking at getting some RJ coordinators into the schools that have made the strongest commitment to having RJ in the buildings. So that's been a huge bunch of work and a huge bunch of circles, both in person and virtually now, to try to have conversations that have taken us there. But it has been a, you know, some some politicking, I'll say, to get different people on board, having everybody in our leadership group get everybody they know to send comments to the school board meeting a couple of meetings ago. And our rule at our school board meeting is that public comments have to be read out loud. So when you have 50 some people who all send a comment about the board adopting restorative justice in their strategic plan, Somehow, suddenly, people who didn't know what RJ is are going, what's restorative justice? And why are all of these people commenting on it? Um, so we've taken the long road because there's suddenly enough momentum in the community to say, we want RJ to be part of our schools. And then an offshoot of that has been a community group that is trying to create the Greater South Bend community to be a restorative justice hub 
and to have a restorative, restorative justice hub to look at things beyond education, to look at policing, to look at police brutality, to look at the way city government is structured, to look at employee disputes and things of that nature. And that is in a, in a more of an infancy stage, even though we've been having conversations for a while. Last year, we thought we had the city council ready to adopt some language and put some budget to it, but you know, politics are what they are. Um, and so COVID has come in and said, okay, this is time to sit back and regroup and how do we get the city government to look at this again? So that's the work of taking what we know about RJ, which is as ancient as the sun, just about, and trying to bring it forward into what we're doing here, both school and community-wide. Didn't turn my mic back on, excellent. Others, others wanna um, chime in to that conversation? I mean, others could be also not just folks who presented if they have expertise or knowledge they'd like to share. I just want to commend what Ellen and her group are doing. I think that's amazing work and a very hard lift. So I just want to give some shout outs. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the political dynamics of that. It's oftentimes hard to get those administrators and school board folks. So in just, just a bit of context from where I am in Greensboro, North Carolina, there have been, there's been a series of, of folks trained on restorative practices through the, the Guilford Public Schools, so th through our public school system. But then how does, you know, what they're doing with that is, is minimal, right? I mean, they've, they've been, tra so training's one thing, but then transfer of that training to, to making real change is another. Um, uh, others wanna chime in? I, I, I'd like to say that, unfortunately, I don't have this experience like uh, Dr. Ellen has, because here in Lithuania, we, we have no this even understanding at school for adults that they don't know how to resolve conflicts. So they know <laughs> they can use force strategy because they are there for that. So that's their role. And this understanding that, okay, maybe I don't know something, I would like to improve my skills. It's so, okay, for children, yeah, for pupils, let's, let's, let's have program for them. But for adults, no. So that's my question will be later on. So how, how, how can you involve teachers in these programs? <laughs> because I, 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 I am not succeeded in this, in this field. I will give you a very quick answer. We help teachers understand that if conflict resolution is working well in their classroom, they have more time to teach and they have to spend less time resolving problems among their students. That is usually how the tough cell teachers are brought on board to what we're doing. What arguments do you use? <laughs> well, usually teachers here, and this may be different, but teachers here usually spend a lot of their time dealing with the problem kids or dealing with kids who get into conflict with each other. And that is wasted instructional time. So I try to get them to see that they're wasting the time that they've got to teach mathematics or to teach literature or history by resolving conflict. And if we get to work with the kids and teach them how to resolve conflict on their own, the teachers waste less of their own time. That's been the most effective argument I've ever used with teachers who kind of don't want to hear it. Right. Yeah, it's the time as a resource, right? I mean, it's it's a similar argument that the RJ movement uses in the court system, right? When you try to do alternative, uh, you know, alternative um, diversionary programs like a conferencing program, for example. Uh, I used to run a, a community conferencing program, and what we would say to participants was, "Have you ever been to court?" And they would say, "Yeah." Well, was that a positive experience? No, not really. Okay, well, here's another option, right? And so, again, kind of playing on that same theme of like, you're wasting a resource of your time, your 
your effort where you could be putting that resource to better use. And if I can chime in, I have to endorse and echo exactly what you're saying. When I've worked with teachers one-on-one -on -one, um, to address behavior issues, that's what gets them. What's in it for you? You get time back to teach. Mm -hmm. That's what's in it for you. And that's a powerful argument. And I've had great success with that. That's what thank you think. Somebody raised her hand, Jennifer, somebody in Winnipeg. <laughs> hi, yeah, hi. I'm, I'm very new. I just wanted to um, say thank you to uh, Dr. Ellen. I'm not going to try to pronounce your last name because that's not going to happen, but uh, really appreciated that, um, you know, of course, with all of the things that we're doing on the grassroots level, you're affecting policy changes and things from a strategic planning point of view with the education system. So I think that's like a huge win because it kind of brings the RJ conversation to like a higher platform and people can really take it seriously. It's not just like another program, but it's actually becoming sort of slowly ingrained in the educational system. So, so awesome. I think that's super work. Uh, and that's really tough. So that's, that's great. Um, and I, I, what I love about both of the presentations and with Grazina's conversation as well is this idea of like, we're trying to shift the culture of our school systems and the culture of school and using these um, strategies that you've come from these programs to shift a culture um, was really inspiring to me. Like it's really nice to see that that's actually happening um, in our schools in a really practical way and not just with all the articles that I'm reading right now because I'm a student. Um, I loved how the student centeredness of it all is also a focus um, because it was kind of linking to what Grazina says, like, how do you convince teachers? Well, I was thinking if, if the students are on board, the teachers are going to have to come on because that's their, you know, that's their audience, right? That's who they're dealing with. So if all the students are saying this is needed and, and I'm loving this program, then chances are they're going to, they're going to carry forth. And I kind of see that in our classrooms, you know, when the students are involved in technology, even the reluctant ones are kind of, they're, they're, they're pulling along with it because they have to, because that's, that's where their audience is going. So it's really nice to change the conversation there. Um, but I do have a question. And my question is, um, when we look at um, uh, putting these into practice, one of the things I think about is, is there ever a stigma that gets attached to our peace patrols and, and different students who you know, either get elected or who volunteer to become part of this? Do they ever experience, do we know any sort of, maybe, so maybe and I, it might not be, um, it might not be really uh, seen, but do they ever experience any types of stigma within the school communities in your experience? And if they have, how has that really been addressed? Thank you. <laughs> um, actually, no, we have, we have not. When we first started the program, we started with five students. We call it small but strong. And before we took on big tasks, big issues, we started small. The school didn't even know who we were. My principal didn't even know. I started, I did it before I got permission, permission to do it. So what we started was, um, we started with doing the bulletin boards in the school because the teachers didn't want to do the bulletin boards. It was a hassle sometimes for counselors. They, they were busy. So we started there. We met a need. And that's how we started getting attention. We met the need. And because we spent a lot of time together, and I really want to say it's very important with a program, you just can't give them a task. You do it. And there is no interaction opportunities, giving them feedback. It's important to give them feedback. So what happened, what, how the program grew, it's because the other students saw, saw how, how the other students, we were having a good time together. We enjoyed each other. We laughed. And another thing with me, my students are with me all the time. I have several responsibilities in the school. Now they have, where it, where they stop is when, it, when I'm dealing with things that, um, that's confidential. 
but they are with me and I felt like the best way that they can see and implement the skills they learn, they have to be connected. They have to see, I have to demonstrate that and how you get adults to be a part of, sometimes you have to give them a task. And I've learned being in the program of coordinator, actually I got into this because I was helping a, a counselor and she said, could you help me with the students? I said, sure. Well, then it turned around where I became the person because she had other things that she needed to do and then I began to learn and um, it was really important to sustain the program. The students, they had to be in charge and they had to get the training. So we have students who have reported, um, other students who wanted to um, complete suicide. We have students who cut um, incidents in the, in the bathroom. So they will report. And actually we really don't have to advertise the program because they see their peers and then they will recommend another peer and they get badges and for every skill they learn we give them a little wristband so one for them to remember the skill that they have learned and then it will spark other students to say well what are you wearing you know and they are able to explain it to give them opportunities to teach the skill or share the skill they have a badge we have badges in our school for professionals they have a badge and they understand the the purpose of the badge the power of the badge and if you do not use the badge appropriately we will take it so it, when it becomes student center it's not so much you know the adults giving all the praise it's peers encouraging the other peers to do and hopefully I answered your question. And I'll pitch in and A, Monica, I have to laugh because when we first started, and this was even before my time, I know we did a lot of bulletin boards. So <laughs> I have to think that bulletin boards in schools are things people want to look good, but they don't want to take the time to do. Yeah, right. So our, especially our middle school and elementary school, part, our partners, we did a lot of um, peace-oriented, conflict resolution-oriented bulletin boards. But I think part of the reason why we don't see stigma attached to what we do is because we use a lot of peer mentoring and older kids working with younger kids models. Mm -hmm. In the high schools, we work with the juniors and seniors and teach them our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then later in the week when they meet with the freshmen they mentor, they reteach what we do. So yes. we have college kids going out and working with the older high school students. They're then working with the freshmen. And you know how it is when you're a younger kid, you always want to emulate the older kid. So we've got that model going on and we use a lot of college students, not just from Notre Dame, but from the other four colleges in South Bend. And we get them involved. We train them and they go out and work with the kids so there's a lot of something cool to be said for yes. the fact that you've got a group of college kids coming out to mm -hmm. work with you. And, and I recruit hard among college guys. I recruit athletes. I recruit guys of color because those are the people who are going to have the best success mm -hmm. in not allowing there to be a stigma in resolving conflict peacefully rather than just amping up a beef you have with somebody. So that's part of what we do. It's, and, and part of it is, that's why we work with adults. There was one day I was sitting in the front office of a school waiting to meet with the principal. And this guy comes in, he is the dad of a boy who he just got a call because his boy was hitting someone and he got called to come pick up the kid. But what I felt when I, when he got there, he's like, okay, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. And you know the poor school secretary has to tell him that the problem is that this that his son has hit, and he goes, oh, "I know who it's going to be." And I told him if that kid gave him lip, he could call off and hit him. That was fine by me. He won't get in any trouble at home. And I thought, "Wow, do I need to ever work with grownups?" 
So that kind of mindset is the other reason why we work with adults, because if adults teach kids that violence is the way to resolve conflict, then that's how kids are going to resolve conflict. So we try to work with adults a lot to sort of wrap around the kid and destigmatize it and show the kid that it's not weak to use skills to deal with somebody instead of using violence to deal with somebody. Yeah, interesting. I'm seeing a question that was in the chat box too, just around, you mentioned again, you know, recruiting male athletes, right? And, and male athletes of color. And I'm just, you know, I think, so maybe we can talk a little bit about the, the gender dynamics of some of this, right? What it's like to, to teach these skills uh, and, and, you know, our entire panel is women, right? <laughs> and what it's like to teach this to, to men versus women. And feel free, any of you, to, to chime in. I mean, have you noticed differences? Are there things that you do differently when you have a different group of people? I think I know the answer to the rest of your question, but I mean, the, part of the question was also around working with incarcerated women. Why not, why not them? Why incarcerated men, right? Well, I, I've worked with incarcerated folks before as well, too. So I, but, I, you know, so Ellen, you can respond to that, but others can respond as well. Well, I work with incarcerated men because that happens to be the incarcerated population I have access to. There is not a prison for women anywhere physically close to South Bend. So the, we work out of the Westville Correctional Facility, which is the largest state prison in Indiana. It houses about 4,000 men. And then here in South Bend, there is a reentry center where men from Westville and from some other state prisons can be transferred for the last couple of years of their sentence because they can work during the day and do different types of lifestyle programming in the evening. That's why I work with men because I have access to them. But I know in my working with adults when I work with men versus I work with women, a lot of times, by the time I get the men, they're at the point in their life where they're ready to hear what I have to say. And working with women at, in the two homeless facilities and at the domestic violence shelter, I've gotten a lot more pushback from them. I think that's interesting, but I have gotten a lot more pushback about, isn't it better to go to the school and make them scared of you? Because then they're going to treat your kid better. So we have a lot of direct conversation about respect versus fear because people confuse those two things for each other. And I talk about role modeling. You know, how do you want your kid to be? What kind of problems can happen to your kids if they resolve their conflicts in a violent way? What's going to happen to them? Is that what you want for your babies? Sure, you want them to be able to handle themselves, but I bet you want something better for your kids. And usually if I can pull on somebody's kids, they're gonna to start to listen. If I can really make them believe that I care what's gonna to happen to their kids, and I do care, so it's pretty easy, but if I can get them to see that I care about what's gonna to happen to their kids just like they do, that's that way in with both men and women. Anyone else care to jump in on that question? Or we have a couple minutes left. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> um, so, I mean, if there are other questions, I, I, I appreciate your guys' connecting, you know, I think these, these presentations went really smooth in, in connecting some ideas about really putting theory to practice and practice to theory, right? Sometimes in our field, peace and conflict studies and peace and justice studies, we, we kind of talk at cross purposes when it comes to theory and practice. And so, you know, there was a bit of, of both in the presentation, so I really appreciate <coughs> that. I wanna encourage people as well before we end to tomorrow, no, it's not tomorrow, Saturday, um, is the next panel for PJSA, and it's actually on participatory action research with restorative roots. Um, and so, 
uh, with the Restorative Roots Collaborative, which is a program that some colleagues up in New York uh, are working on. And so, you know, I, I greatly look forward to that. I'm actually facilitating that discussion as well in the midst of, of a PGSA board meeting because um, we're having our PGSA board meeting and then we're all going to take a break. So hopefully many of the PGSA board folks will be at that presentation as well because it will kind of be our lunch break. And then ending out our restorative justice um, schedule for September is the keynote talk Freedom on the Inside by Erica Huggins. And so I encourage you guys to come to that as well. That is a that is Thursday uh, evening. And unfortunately, it does cross, I said this earlier to some of you, it does cross the first presidential debate. So DVR that presidential debate. If it was funny, we had a, a, a email chain going back and forth and my response was, is anybody undecided still about the presidential, <laughs> you know, right? So, but if you are undecided, you, you should probably watch the debate, but you can, you can record it and still uh, come to, to listen to, to Erica Huggins in our, in our last uh, September event. And let me just remind people as well, if you're, if you're interested in the October events, make sure you get on and register again because you'll need a separate ticket for the October events for the PJSA conference, as well as for the November events. Um, so I hope to see the rest of you and many of you back on here. And uh, Grajina, thank you very much for staying up so late with us in Lithuania. We appreciate it. Um, uh, yes, the last keynote is the tw Tuesday the 29th. Um, uh, the Erica Huggins talk is Tuesday the 29th. Um, so I thank you all for, for participating and I, we're, we're right about at the end of our time together anyway. If anybody else would like to say anything or share anything, we've got a couple of minutes left, but I really do appreciate your guys' time and commitment to peace and justice. Thank you. <laughs> thank you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>